podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Today is Thursday, August 27th. I'm Donna Will, Professional Development Coordinator for the Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to roles and responsibilities of a quality advisory council using data to improve system performance. We have Val Bradley, President Emerita at the Human Service Research Institute as our presenter for today. And also with us is Patricia Sustoki, Director of Programs with DBA. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode to start. Once the interactive portion of the webinar is underway, we can unmute participants for questions. There are two options for listening to the webinar, and that's by computer or by phone. And there is a handout in the webinar platform in the panel to your right. Um, we are recording the webinar, and uh, any questions you have can be typed in the chat box or question box in the webinar panel. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Patricia Sastoki. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Donna. Thank you so much. Um, and just to just to uh, remind everybody is that while we want you to type questions in the chat box, we actually, once Valerie stops presenting, we're going to unmute everybody so that you can just ask the questions um, as you see them coming in. Um, but it is an honor and a privilege to be able to introduce um, Valerie Bradley, who I think is a catalyst in the field of developer disabilities. She is a wonderful mentor, my mentor when I was in Louisiana and had the privilege of working with her. And I just think it's always very delightful to, for her to be able to come and join us and to talk to you guys a little bit about the roles and responsibilities of the Quality Council and how your role is really important and critical to the DDA to provide us with guidance and supports and recommendations. Um, and you, you heard um, Donna mention that she's the president, founder of, you know, of um, the, um, the uh, Institute for um, Human Resource Research Institute, and also a catalyst on the national core indicators in looking at really what makes people's quality of life uh, improve in not only just in Maryland, but across the United States and nationally. So Valerie, it is a pleasure to have you on this webinar with us. So thank you. Oh, Patricia, thank you for those kind words. Um, I've known Patricia a long time, and Maryland is very lucky to have her in a key policy role in the state. Uh, it's also good to be back uh, with the Maryland Quality Advisory Council. Uh, I spoke to this group what, probably five or six years ago. Uh, some of you may still uh, be on the council, but I gather there are some new members of the council. So welcome. So what I'm hoping to do today is to um, really give you an understanding of what it means to be part of a group like this, why your role is important, how you should think about the information that you're getting, um, and how to be deliberate about understanding what that information means and what to do about it. So we're going to start um, with, let me make sure I can move the, all right. There we go. Um, with a parable that I've used for many years uh, to help people think about why multiple perspectives are important uh, in understanding a larger phenomenon. In this case, the phenomenon uh, is an elephant. Um, and perhaps you're aware of the uh, parable that suggested that a group of blind men got together um, to try and understand what this phenomenon was. And given their particular perspective, uh, they obviously had a different understanding of what it was they were looking at. Uh, the guy in the tail thought the elephant was a rope. The guy on the ladder thought it was a wall. The guy with the trunk thought it was a snake. Uh, so this is just my way of saying um, that each of you brings a specific and important perspective um, to a quality advisory council. So in order to understand quality, you know, the field that we're a part of has many different perspectives. Uh, and it's important that those perspectives 
uh, be part of any discussion about quality. So first of all, people who are actually receiving uh, supports from the state, uh, family members of people receiving services, providers, those who are supporting uh, people with disabilities and residential day programs, case managers, uh, and of course, direct support professionals uh, who really have an understanding of the system at the ground level. Public managers uh, like Patricia and others uh, who have a more holistic view of the system. And finally, advocates, people from the ARC, self-advocates, et cetera. So in order to really get a good understanding of quality, you need to hear each person's, each participant's perspective. So Donna, I think we have a poll at this point. Yes. I think, um, well, it's um, what does quality mean to you? And you can, I think you can only select one. So maybe what, use the, um, what, what does it most mean to you? So the first response is person-centeredness, choice and self-direction, rights and respect, health and wellness, and safety. So uh, go ahead and vote. I'll take a few minutes. Okay, we're going to wrap up um, in just a second. I'm going to close the poll. Okay, it looks like 30% said person centeredness, 40% said choice and self direction, 10% said rights and respect. And 10% said health and wellness, and 10% said safety. Interesting. So different perspectives, uh, different priorities, uh, all, of course, important to uh, quality of services for people with disabilities. Um, OK. Let's go to the next slide. So why do we care about quality? Um, and I have to admit to being a veteran in this field, I came into the field, oh, roughly 50 years ago. Um, so I have been lucky enough to see an incredible amount of change and progress. Uh, when I first came into this field, most people who were receiving services uh, were in custodial uh, institutions. Um, and how much has changed is really quite dramatic. So we really have created a movement. Um, and as part of that movement, we made important promises to people with disabilities uh, and their families that this community system that we've built uh, was gonna be better, better than institutions, better than custodial care. So we need to continue to keep that promise. Ideology alone, unfortunately, uh, does not necessarily create a stable and reliable system of supports. Uh, simply saying you believe in person-centered practices or choice and control doesn't make it so. Uh, we have to make sure that our ideology is carried out in practice. Um, and we are no longer a boutique program. Um, the intellectual and developmental disability system uh, is now vast and represents millions and billions of dollars uh, of investment. Uh, so the more the taxpayers have uh, as investors in our system, uh, the greater the expectations, the more pressure uh, there is to live up to those expectations. And finally, it only makes sense that we need to know uh, what's working in the system and what isn't working. Do we have some legacy services, for instance, uh, that are past their sell-by date, uh, that are no longer meeting the needs of people with disabilities uh, and their families? Oops, 
one too many. Um, so the way we measure performance, um, it, it's not just in terms of how many widgets get sold, uh, but in our field, it, it's really performance that tracks and mirrors our values. So if you think about quality indicators, um, given what you've all said about what you think quality is, we want to know whether services and supports are in fact person-centered and individually tailored. Again, just because we say we believe in person-centered practices does not necessarily mean that they're manifest in the system. Are people given the opportunity to self-direct their services and supports? Uh, and even if they're not in a formal self-direction program, are they living self-determined lives? Uh, people in provider supports, are they given the ability to make choices and to control some of the aspects, some or all of the aspects uh, of their daily lives? Of enormous importance are people uh, free from harm and abuse. Um, also, do they enjoy good health? It's very hard to uh, be able to experience quality of life and all the outcomes we want for people if people aren't well or if they're in abusive and exploitive situations. Are people really part of our communities? Do they get involved in the civic life of their communities? Uh, are they really able to participate as citizens and not continually living in uh, a segregated, isolated way? Are people supported to be independent? Do we help them from an early age to learn how to make decisions on their own behalf, how to take risks, et cetera? Um, do people have friends and relationships other than people who are paid to support them? Uh, do they have things to do during the day that are important to them, uh, including employment, which we haven't done a very good job on? And are we supporting families? Uh, I think in, in many states, uh, the majority of people receiving supports uh, and funding uh, are living with their families. So are we doing a good job of supporting those families? Do they have the resources that they need? So what are quality council responsibilities? Um, there are quality councils now in a number of different states um, that are constituted in, in a way similar to your own advisory council. So first of all, uh, one really important responsibility is to explore whether the quality processes that the state uses um, to, to understand whether quality is present or not, do they really generate data and information related to the department's mission? Uh, really do the data collection um, tools, protocols, really align uh, with getting information about whether the mission is being accomplished. Um, also to look for ways to make that data more accessible. Uh, is the data broadly transparent? Is it accessible not just to uh, people with, a, with professional understanding of data, but is it accessible and made explicitly accessible uh, to people with disabilities and their families? Um, and to help to support DDA to use data to improve system and participant outcomes. Uh, because just collecting data um, isn't good enough. One really needs to have processes in place um, where that data is understood and used to move the system ahead. To develop recommendations and projects uh, aimed at issues that you see arising in the data uh, and that can reasonably be expected to actually result in some system improvement. Once you've identified projects, initiatives, recommendations, um, do you follow up to make sure that those recommendations have in fact uh, been implemented? Uh, and is there data uh, that shows that those recommendations actually created the outcome that you hoped for? Um, you need to develop um, some sort of schedule for the information that you want to review uh, on an ad hoc and regular basis. 
you obviously don't want to overwhelm um, yourselves with too much information. So making a really, um, uh, I, word I come up with is parsimonious, but a, a decision about how much data you want to review, what kinds of data you want to review, and on what kind of schedule. Uh, and to review system performance in Maryland with other states through national core indicators. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about national core indicators later on in this presentation. Donna, you want to put up the next poll? Yep. So what can you most bring to the Quality Council? Uh, the, the responses are my personal experience as a participant or a family member, my administrative experience, my experience as a IDD provider, my experience as a case manager, or my experience as a direct support professional. So we'll take a moment to answer those. Okay, it looks like almost everybody has voted. Give you five more seconds. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Okay, it looks like um, most of you are saying that your administrative experience, 40% uh, said that that was what you bring. 30% uh, said personal experience as a participant or family member. And then 10% of you said experience as a provider and case manager also got 10% and direct support professional also got 10%. So I'm gonna hide the polls now. Well, that's great. Um, so it, it looks as though this council really does bring together those um, varied perspectives um, on the system and on quality and what it means uh, and how to improve it. So that's great. Thank you. So what does it mean to be a participant on a quality council? And I think this is an important um, set of issues to, uh, to focus on because I think a lot of us a lot of people in this field have been on advisory committees of different kinds, um, but this is really a qualitatively different kind of function. Um, and as I've said, each person's input is needed uh, to ensure that multiple perspectives are represented. There's a reason why there are multiple perspectives on this council. So because each of you represents one of those perspectives, it's important that you make sure you make input um, that you participate in the conversations or else that particular perspective is missing from the conversation. Uh, so active participation is important uh, given the need for continuity of conversations. Uh, so it means attending the meetings, uh, just dipping in and out every so often uh, really does disservice well to the perspectives you're bringing to the group. Um, and does um, mean people have to repeat themselves uh, if you haven't been able to be at the last one or two meetings. And I think importantly, this is really not a forum for individual issues that you bring or, or grievances. Uh, it's really a, forming, a, a forum for discussing system level issues uh, that you identify in the data. Uh, that doesn't mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't bring your own experience to that. Uh, but this is not a place simply to air grievances. Uh, it, it, it's a place to understand what the data is saying about the performance of the Maryland IDD system. And Equality Council relies on people bringing an open and sometimes skeptical mind to the discussion, a little bit of critical thinking here, uh, not bringing specific agendas. It's keeping an open mind. Uh, and I would urge your chair or your co-chairs uh, to make sure um, in these conversations that everyone's voice is heard. So just to reflect on the mission of the uh, Developmental Disabilities Administration, 
Um, and I, this, this is an old slide, so I'm hoping the mission has not changed. Patricia, you can correct me if you've added anything to this. Um, but to provide programmatic leadership in the design and development of services to afford people with developmental disabilities and their families a seamless service system that is responsive to the person's needs and personal outcomes. The vision, people will have full lives in the community of their choice where they are included, participate, and are active citizens. And DDA's goal, all Marylanders lead personally defined and fulfilling lives. So hopefully when you're measuring quality, some part of that measurement is to find out whether the mission, vision, and goals uh, are in fact being realized. Um, and I believe this was the mission uh, of the Quality Advisory Committee a few, few years ago, unless again, Patricia, this has been uh, changed. But um, the purpose of the Quality Advisory Council is to provide the DDA uh, with input and recommendations regarding the following areas. Uh, assisting DDA in determining how to measure quality um, that in order to improve the lives of people with disabilities. To review the data uh, that come out of the various uh, measurement and monitoring structures that the DDA has in place. Uh, and also to uphold a commitment to the basic assurances. Um, I think some of you may know, but the, uh, each state that gets uh, Medicaid money for Medicaid waivers, uh, which is the funding that supports the lion's share of IDD services, each state has to ensure uh, and affirm to the centers, the U.S. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, that they are in fact carrying out some basic assurances, um, like having a plan of care that reflects individual goals, like having an incident management system that tracks incidents and mortality, uh, that does a good job of overseeing uh, provider characteristics, et cetera. So every so many years, uh, DDA and other states have to provide evidence to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that they have in fact uh, met those assurances and have the evidence to prove it. Uh, suggest ways to improve compliance uh, with some of those waiver assurances and recommend ways that the DDA uh, can implement and enhance its policies and programs uh, for individuals with disabilities. And Val, that's still the case. Those are exactly the, the main areas we wanted uh, this group to focus on. And we have reminded that um, in the past, um, the DDA has not met the basic assurances at all. Gotcha. Thank you, Petra Shah. That's very helpful. Okay. Um, quality council functions. Um, first of all, to develop a mission that's been done. Um, identify priorities, uh, review data associated with those priorities, uh, and in reviewing that data, uh, identifying any issues uh, that really come to the top uh, insofar as things that need to be uh, remediated. Then think about what would in fact, what kind of initiatives would in fact uh, ameliorate or uh, uh, resolve whatever issues you identify. And then finally, assuming that you put some initiatives in place through DDA uh, to continue to track whether those initiatives really have made any quantitative and qualitative difference. So let's talk first about identifying priorities. You can't do everything. Um, it's, it's human nature uh, to want to really solve all of the world's problems, but uh, in fact we can't, uh, and a group of volunteers that meets only so often uh, really needs to target your energies uh, to a few key uh, priorities. Um, so uh, things like participant outcomes. Is employment a big issue in Maryland? Uh, I think it's probably a significant issue everywhere, and in fact the, uh, the pandemic has sort of disrupted a lot of the, uh, the progress we made up till now, unfortunately. Um, is inclusion 
uh, one of your priorities. Health and well-being, some other quality of life outcome. Or are you concerned about abuse, neglect, and exploitation? Have there been uh, some data available recently that show an uptick uh, or a troubling trend in that data? Uh, mortality, are, are you seeing uh, people dying of things that uh, could have been prevented with better targeted uh, symptom spotting? Have there been provider compliance issues that are troubling? Um, or are there some larger system change goals, uh, improvements in quality assurance, uh, are there staff training issues? Anyway, those are just some of the issues that you may want to take on. Uh, so at this point, we have another poll, Donna. Yes. Okay, so what is your priority issue? Please select either employment, inclusion, health and safety, provider capabilities, staff and training, or abuse and neglect. And maybe this, you have another priority, but within these priorities, how would you rank the one you find the most important? And half of you have voted. We'll take a few more moments. Okay, it looks like most of you voted. Um, we're going to close the poll. Okay, so zero for employment, 36% said inclusion, 36% said health and safety, 27% said provider capabilities, staff training, and 0% for abuse and neglect. Interesting. Well, then you've honed some issues right there. That's great. Um, thanks very much. Uh, we'll take that under consideration. Um, this is just one way of thinking about uh, the importance of an issue. Uh, it's called a heat map. Um, so there, in, in this sort of formulation, there are four types of issues. One is something that doesn't occur very often. And even when it does occur, there's a low risk of it really being um, detrimental uh, to the system or to people with disabilities. For instance, um, you're not, some of the eligibility determinations uh, are late uh, and therefore um, hold up uh, people being given immediate access to services. Um, high incidence, low risk, uh, something that happens unfortunately frequently, uh, but really doesn't pose uh, a risk to individuals or to the system, like incomplete staff logs. Um, then there are low incidence um, issues, but that have a significant uh, health risk. Uh, if you have a problem in misdiagnosing health conditions, uh, some of the things that we look at here in Massachusetts and help DSP spot are things like impacted bowel syndrome, which is remediable, uh, but if not attended to, uh, can pose a serious health risk to people. Hang on a minute, I'm going to take a drink of water. Then there are high incidence, high risk issues. If all of a sudden you have a, a, a spike in the numbers of people who have fallen, uh, especially among older people with IDD, that's a, it's high incidence and a very high risk uh, for serious injury and in the case of older people, many times uh, mortality. So one way to think about issues. And this is just, well, a little falling joke. Um, polar bear on his back. Okay. So the next function of the Quality Council, Quality Advisory Council is to review data, information, what does that mean? Um, there are several types of information um, that could be available to you. Um, 
first of all, quantitative versus qualitative data. Quantitative data is data that is numerical, uh, in, such as counts, rates, percentages, et cetera, uh, incident rates, uh, say the rate of people who are employed, uh, the rate of people um, who have various health conditions, et cetera. Qualitative data is more observational and descriptive. Um, case studies, where you look at two or three agencies uh, to really think about the virtues of, of uh, approaches to staff training. Um, so you do a case study to see how that training really worked. Did people like it or not? Did clients find it uh, uh, an improvement? Um, focus groups also can be sources of qualitative data. Um, and one is not necessarily better than the other. They are used for different purposes, um, but understanding the difference is important. Uh, and then there's point in time data versus longitudinal data. Um, point in time just means uh, you're taking the, the temperature or the, or the pulse of the system at a particular point in time. So as of you know, the end of June uh, 2020, uh, approximately 20% of people receiving services had a job. Uh, as opposed to something that you track over time, the same group of people looking at an outcome over time. Uh, many years ago, uh, we did a study of the closure of a big institution in Pennsylvania called Pennhurst, uh, which became sort of a co-celeb because it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, but there, uh, the, the research team, we tracked uh, really the outcomes of the same group of people over five years, people who'd been in Pennhurst and who moved out. Uh, so that you had a longitudinal look uh, at how those people uh, fared in terms of their health and welfare, their satisfaction with services, et cetera. Then there's objective data uh, versus subjective data. Uh, objective data you know, comes from direct observation, uh, from a text, uh, from an exam, uh, like a heart exam, um, or, or from uh, demographic information in a record, such things as gender, et cetera, age, weight. Subjective data um, really is data from the point of view of a participant or a family member uh, in terms of their experience of the system, whether it's their experience of being included in their communities, having choices, uh, having relationships, et cetera. Uh, and that kind of data uh, is some of the data we collect in national core indicators. So this is just a little story. Uh, I, it's, it's a fascinating story, but it shows the, uh, the importance and the power of collecting data. Um, this is a, a story about the Broad Street pump. Uh, and when we're finished with this, if you're interested, uh, you know, go to Wikipedia and you can read more about it. But it is a, a, a very important event in the history of, of epidemiology, um, really, in the world. Um, but if we go back to the 19th century, uh, in the mid-19th century, uh, there were significant outbreaks of cholera uh, into the 1850s. Um, and you have to remember uh, that at that time, um, there really weren't comprehensive, comprehensive sewage systems. Uh, a lot of communities relied on old cesspools that hadn't been cleaned out for millennia. Um, so it was a very different time. And insofar as what people understood to be the reasons for cholera, um, the predominant theory was something called the miasma theory, uh, which basically assumed that illness and uh, infection outbreaks like this were caused by bad air, uh, sort of poisonous air. Um, that came from rotting uh, organic matter. Um, so it, it really bad smells, if you want to think of it that way, uh, were how the, the, the um, illness 
got into your body. And the, the germ theory was only beginning to be uh, explored and um, hadn't been embraced by the scientific community. So a guy named John Snow, who really became the first real epidemiologist, uh, was a physician. And he really believed that cholera wasn't caused by smelling bad air, uh, but was caused by bad water, contaminated water. He was a physician uh, and a curious and, and inventive guy. Um, and he lived close to the Broad Street pump a few blocks away. Uh, and it became obvious that there was something peculiar in this immediate community because the death rate from cholera uh, within a few blocks of this pump was substantially higher than it was in other parts of London uh, that got their water from different sources. Um, so he, by collecting data uh, in this community and in other communities, um, he knew that there was something specific about the water source that came out of this particular pump. So he argued to the city fathers um, about his theory. They were skeptical, uh, but they said, well, what the heck? We'll take the uh, crank, we'll take the handle off the pump, uh, which basically disabled the ability to use it and see what happens. Lo and behold, uh, the incidence of cholera uh, went down to almost nothing. Um, so using data, he proved that this particular outbreak was related to the water coming through that pump. It was later determined that because of these cesspools, uh, a family with a baby that had cholera had uh, washed the diaper and thrown the water into that cesspool, which then ended up uh, contaminating that particular source of water. So with Florence Nightingale, uh, Snow led a movement uh, for improved hygiene uh, that really uh, changed a, a lot of the way that uh, health services are delivered, how we think about water. Uh, so it was a very important moment, um, but also I think a good example of not directly related to our field, but the power of collecting data in a rational, um, organized way. So when you get data, um, what do you need to ask? First of all, most importantly, is the data valid? Uh, meaning, does it is it really answering the questions that you want answered? Is the data really a reflection of what it is that you want to measure. Secondly, is it reliable? And that basically means that if Patricia goes and interviews a person with disability using a standardized survey, and I go and interview that same person uh, with the same survey, will I get the same results? Meaning, therefore, is it a reliable survey? Secondly, um, how big was the sample? Was it really a representative sample? Um, and there you can ask about confidence levels. How confident is the state that this sample that they've drawn uh, really is a reflection of the larger population? Uh, it's safe to say that you, know, you can't, for many purposes, go out and interview everybody receiving services. Uh, so you have to do a sample of records or a sample of case management records, a sample of individuals. But the question is, is that sample uh, really uh, a powerful sample that allows you to generalize to the larger population of people receiving services? Uh, and is it a random sample? Uh, or is it what we call a convenient sample? Meaning, I just have a link to a survey that I send out uh, to a, a bunch of people in the state. I don't really know who's going to answer it, who isn't going to answer it. Um, so it doesn't mean that a convenient sample isn't as, uh, doesn't give us some information. It, it just means it's not as uh, valid and reliable as a randomly constituted and big enough sample. Um, when was the data collected? Um, is this data within the last six months? 
Uh, was it collected a year ago? Um, is it past its sell-by date? Have things intervened in the meantime uh, that might change the results were you to collect the same data today? So another question to ask. Um, and what are the ranges, not just averages? Uh, if you're collecting data regionally, uh, yeah, you may want to look uh, at the state uh, uh, average, uh, but then uh, underneath that may be some significant ranges of compliance or outcomes, uh, depending on what region it is. So you need to ask questions about that as well. And then is the data potentially biased? Um, is it provider self-report, for instance? Um, so those are some important questions to ask as you review data as part of your responsibilities. So always make sure uh, you analyze the analysis. How has the data been analyzed? Uh, what expertise has been brought to bear? Uh, have they controlled for various aspects of the data uh, to make sure there isn't any contamination? Um, I, and make sure you identify big issues that may compromise the data. Uh, you, as I said, was it collected a while back? Have circumstances intervened um, that might have uh, changed the outcome? Um, and again, don't generalize the findings beyond their limits. If it is a good sample, if it was randomly collected, if there is a 95% confidence level, then you probably can generalize. But if it's just a 10% sample, uh, a convenient sample, uh, then you may not want to generalize. You may want to look at other data. And that's the last part. Um, if you have some questions uh, about a particular um, finding, are there other data sources to make sure that whatever that finding was is substantiated in other ways? So never uh, make assumptions about the data. Make sure you ask questions, the kind of questions that we just discussed. And as I said, don't expand the findings to the whole DDA population unless you have confidence um, that it is, uh, you have a high enough confidence level in those results. And don't treat data significant as significant unless it says so. I mean, I can show you a lot of charts from National Core Indicators uh, where one group, uh, let's say the numbers of people in group homes uh, who um, are, have privacy in their living quarters compared to the numbers in other kinds of residential settings who have that experience. And it may look like one is better than the other. Maybe it's even a difference in four or five points uh, on the scale. But unless they tell you that that's a significant difference, and that's, and I'm not a statistician, and I don't know how to do that, but they should be able to tell you whether those differences you're seeing are significant. Um, otherwise, the difference is just noise in the data. So just because things look like one thing is better than the other, you need to make sure that that difference is significant and therefore needs some reaction. And don't jump to conclusions, again, without checking other sources. Okay, I think our last poll question, Donna. Yeah. <clears throat> what would you like to know more about? So the choices are how data is collected, validity and reliability of the data, the sample size, the limitations of the data, and the last time the relevance of the data was reviewed. And you can only choose one, so pick the one that you find to be most true for yourself. Okay, so um, we'll take a few moments and it looks like 64% voted. So I think we can, we're at 71%. All right, five seconds. Okay, we're gonna close the poll. Okay, so 25% um, said how data is collected, 
25% said validity and reliability of the data. Zero said sample size. 33% said the limitations of the data and 17% said the last time the relevance of the data was reviewed. Great, that means you all have a different perspective and you'll all be asking important questions with respect to data collection. Thank you, that's the last poll question. So it's important when you're looking at data, um, again, not necessarily to take findings at face value because you may end up with some potential misinterpretations. Let's say that over a given period of time, uh, the numbers of reported incidents of restraints goes up. That could indicate a serious problem, right? However, it may also be a positive indicator if reforms have been put into place to incentivize providers to report restraints. This may be a positive indicator. Therefore, it's important to understand the whole context. And that's what I meant by, has some event occurred since the data was collected or before the data was collected um, that would have influenced it in one way or the other? Uh, so in this case, it may be that a very low rate of reported incidents of restraints is a negative finding uh, because the door has been opened and perhaps restraints have been uh, redefined to be a broader category. Uh, so again, you need to understand the underlying context, any policy changes, et cetera, that may have taken place. Uh, another possible uh, misunderstanding, let's say the numbers of admissions to hospitals increases. Um, that could mean, certainly, that there are serious issues uh, at the provider level uh, with respect to the protection of health. Um, however, another explanation might be that providers in the state have been trained to use something like the health risk screening tool uh, recently to identify red flags that suggest the need for medical treatment and, and better surveillance. And that surveillance may have resulted in more necessary hospitalizations. So again, you need to understand the surrounding circumstances uh, before you jump to conclusions. Okay, identify issues. That's another thing on your to-do list. So how do you decide what issues uh, you're going to address, issue or issues. First of all, um, does it have, a, a, again, back to that heat map, um, has it, uh, does it have an impact on numerous individuals? Uh, so it has broad impact across your system, or is it having a profound impact on a smaller group of individuals? Um, is it an important compliance issue uh, with federal or state requirements? Uh, does it get to those waiver assurances that I mentioned earlier? Um, is it this issue costly to the system? Uh, one issue I can think of is the high turnover of, among direct support professionals. Um, that kind of turnover has enormous costs in terms of retraining, um, in terms of recruitment, et cetera. Is the problem getting worse? Um, and is it a problem that really within your scope and within the uh, um, power of DDA, is it amenable to improvement? Um, you know, curing poverty is probably not something, um, it's, it would be great if we could, but it's probably not within the scope of influence of this council or of DDA, um, and that improvement isn't going to take the next 10 years, although obviously if you can see incremental change over time, that's important. Um, is it likely to um, require a reasonable resource expenditure, or are you talking about um, a, a quality improvement initiative uh, that really is way beyond the scope of the current budget? Uh, or the political reality uh, that the legislature is working within? And does it align uh, with other agency priorities? 
So you, you've looked at the data, you've thought about what issues are important, uh, and now it's time to think about what the heck you do about it. What kind of remediation strategies uh, can you recommend to DDA? Are there things you could do as a council, et cetera? Um, so QA, quality uh, improvement intervention and remediation plans. So how do you go about thinking about uh, a quality initiative? First of all, you have to state the problem. What is the problem you're trying to address? Um, too many people are falling. People do not have jobs. Um, you're seeing an uptick in certain kinds of causes of mortality. What's the problem? You want to get people more jobs. You want to have people more included in their communities. You want to make sure that the individual planning process is more person driven, etc. So what's the problem and how will you be able to measure whether or not it's addressed? So once you've found the problem, you have some data that backed it up, um, is it really necessary to make some additional steps uh, to examine the issue? Uh, are there some ad hoc data collection efforts uh, that you need to undertake? Uh, to make sure you fully explore the issue. Um, put a name to this quality initiative, um, the employment initiative, the friendship initiative, the person-centered planning initiative, uh, and identify exactly who is responsible for carrying it out. Uh, is it the DDA? Is it the, a council working group? Is it a collaboration of organizations? Might the ARC take a role? And then brainstorming the possible interventions um, that you might take. Uh, you know, if their issue is employment, is one of the barriers to getting people employed that families are worried about their family member losing their benefits. So is the intervention then some sort of educational initiative with families to help them understand um, how the the, uh, the benefit issue can be finessed and how people can, in fact, have jobs and, and earn some money. Uh, and thinking about the barriers to your interventions and how you can actually minimize those barriers. Um, then select your strategy uh, and apply the intervention, remembering that you need to measure how it works. So tracking the implementation of that initiative is crucial. Uh, one construct uh, that I think a lot of people in the quality business are familiar with uh, is the plan, do, act, check. Um, uh, a circle, <laughs> it is a circle, uh, but, but a chain that helps you understand um, how to move from one step to the next. So first we talked about planning, sitting down, naming the, uh, the initiative, figuring out who's gonna be responsible, outlining the steps for implementing a change. Uh, possibly if it's a big enough change, you might wanna test it in a smaller group of people or in a particular part of the state. Let's say that your initiative is to develop some educational materials for families. Well, why don't we find a focus group of families that maybe the ARC or others could help you uh, organize uh, and see what those um, materials, whether those materials change minds, whether they, the group suggests other possible changes, uh, and then checking, looking to see what, result, what the results were uh, from that perhaps small scale pilot, uh, figure out what you've learned, and then take action. Uh, if in fact it looks like your materials really worked, you were able to get some good input for those families, uh, then going forward uh, to uh, make it a statewide initiative. If it didn't work, if the families just sort of said ho-hum, they weren't moved by your rhetoric, um, then starting over again with a different plan. Um, and if you're successful, you can incorporate what you've learned from the test into wider changes, uh, and apply what you've learned for new improvements, beginning the cycle all over again. Um, so that is plan, do, check, act. 
Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how data um, can really help you understand uh, issues that um, you may want to focus on. Uh, for those of you who don't know what National Core Indicators uh, is, National Core Indicators was started back in, in 1997. Uh, it, it is a collaboration uh, between us here at Human Services Research Institute and the National Association of State Directors of Developmental Disability Services. Uh, way back in 97, a group of state uh, public managers got together to really think about uh, how they would know if their mission, if all the things they had done to improve services, uh, were really having an impact on people's lives. Um, so they came together uh, to collaborate around the National Core Indicators. Uh, and we developed uh, an in-person survey. Uh, we developed family surveys. More recently, we developed staff stability surveys, which really help us understand issues around direct support turnover and retention. But the heart of really the National Core Indicators is uh, the in-person survey. Uh, and I should mention that since 1997, we now have 47 states in the District of Columbia who participate in collecting the same data um, regarding the experiences of people with disabilities and their families. So we're able to compare state performance, we're able to develop national norms. Um, the, the, the protocol, the survey itself, has changed slightly over time as priorities like self-direction and person-centered practices uh, have come to the fore. Uh, but Maryland has been a member of NCI for a number of years. I think you haven't collected the in-person data for the last couple of years. Is that right, Patricia? Maybe you're going to be collecting it in the next cycle? That's correct. Yeah. Um, but there is data which you could access to see some of the, the data that has been collected in the past. If you go to our website, nationalcoreindicators.org, go to state reports, go to Maryland, uh, you can see some of the data from a couple of years ago. You can also go to the national report and see where Maryland stacks up in terms of it, individual outcomes, whether they rate above the norm, at the norm, or below the norm. This year, as you can imagine, um, in March, we had to, um, <clears throat> or early April, we had to stop the in-person data collection, uh, given the health issues surrounding uh, COVID. Um, luckily, about 26 states had already collected enough um, uh, surveys um, to have a, a level of confidence that we thought was sufficient to publish their data. Going forward, um, we will, in the next fiscal year, be doing a remote survey, as you can imagine, because I don't think any of us, unfortunately, believe that this virus is going to go away uh, until we're able to get a good vaccination um, for the virus. So we will be doing um, surveys on, on social media, on you know, Skype-like platforms with people with disabilities, and hoping that since many of them have been introduced to this technology uh, in terms of remote assessments, remote case management, uh, that they will be more comfortable with this technology than perhaps they've been in the past. But the, the in-person survey collects data on all of those topics that we discussed earlier in this presentation, uh, including relationships, choice and control, health and safety, rights and responsibilities, uh, inclusion, et cetera. Uh, the survey probably takes about 40 minutes. Um, and we now have data on probably, when California joined it, approximately over 20,000 people a year. So it's probably one of the largest databases on the experiences of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the world. Yeah. And I think I say that without fear of contradiction. So here are just some little data bits um, that help you understand how data can really give you um, some hints about where problems might be. 
This one is, is you know, I think a particularly graphic example. Um, this is uh, on the employment questions. So first of all, we ask people whether they have a community job. Uh, and this is 1819 data. Um, and this percentage, 19% is really unfortunately not moved. Uh, it's moved a little bit in the last period of time, uh, but it's stayed pretty level. So 19% of people in that survey year uh, had a community job, uh, not a, a facility-based job, uh, but an actual community job. So of the people who said, no, I don't have a job, that's the next circle, 44% of those people said, yeah, I darn well would like a job. I don't have a job, but I really would like one. So then we looked at the people who said, yeah, I would like a job, and discovered that only 36% of those people who wanted a job had employment as a goal in their plan. So that's a pretty straightforward um, issue, a, a fairly easily remediable issue, making sure that the guidelines uh, for individual planning, uh, strongly suggest um, that if an individual wants a job, they need to have an employment goal in their plan. In fact, um, about six years ago, the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services issued something, something called the settings rule, um, which had many aspects. Uh, at the core of it was to make sure that people uh, were included in their communities and weren't isolated. Um, but the rules stress that everybody ought to have the opportunity to have a job if they want one. Uh, so the fact that only 36% of people who wanted a job had it in their plan is a big, fat, juicy target, as far as I'm concerned, for improvement, that is. Um, another question we ask, um, community participation and leisure. Uh, so we ask questions about, are you able to go out and do things that you like to do in the community? Uh, are you able to go out and do things you like to do as much as you want? So it's one thing, yeah, I get out to see a movie every now and then, but do you get out and do the things you want uh, as many times as you want? Um, and then do you have enough things to do when you're at home? Now, this question uh, becomes enormously important during this last period of time uh, when, and this was obviously 18, 19 before the pandemic, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what people will say going forward, uh, given that many of them were isolated in their homes. But here is a graphic example of what I said earlier about paying attention to the range of responses. Uh, in the example I gave earlier, I was talking about the range perhaps regionally within Maryland, but this is the range in our NCI state data. So the numbers of people who got to do things they like to do in the community range from 66% of people in one state all the way to 95% of people in another state. That's a big range. And the next one, able to go out as much as I want to. 41% in one state, all the way up to 92%. And again, has enough time, things to do at home. The range 67% to 93%. So important, again, when you're looking at your state's data, uh, even though, well, let's say it's 72%. Well, that sounds kind of good, almost three quarters of people. Uh, but then you look at the national data to see where Maryland stands, and you find that, well, I don't know that this is true, but you're slightly below the norm, and the ranges go all the way up to 92%, which should suggest to you that there may be some room for improvement, because clearly uh, in other states, um, they have been able to offer people more opportunities to explore their communities. Uh, this is privacy and rights, uh, not terribly surprising. 
I mentioned uh, earlier the uh, home and community-based settings rule that CMS uh, promulgated, uh, I think, six years ago, 19 or 2014. Um, and there, there's a lot of stress uh, on privacy issues uh, in provider-controlled residences. Uh, do people have a key? Can they come and go? Can they lock their bedroom? Um, and not surprisingly, uh, first of all, the overall for had a key was less than 50%, about 48%. But just 12% of people who lived in an ICF IDD or uh, other institutional setting had a key. And only 31% uh, of people who lived in group residences. Now, in, in your own home, 80% of people had a key. Uh, if you live with your parents, 53% foster care, host home, 40%. The next bars have to do with, can you lock your bedroom? Uh, again, 20, only 21% of people who live in institutional settings, uh, and you can see the spread there. Um, the next one has to do with voting, um, which is another interesting uh, area that one might want to take on, especially this year, uh, in terms of voting in terms of improvement. And here again, you see the extraordinary ranges. Um, this is, we ask people, have you ever voted in a local state or federal election, or at least were given the opportunity and chose not to. Uh, and here the states range from 7% uh, to 58%. 58%, in fact, is bigger than, uh, I think, in 16, the number was about 55 percent and then maybe like 50 percent in 2018 in the general population um so whatever state that 58 percent was in that's a higher percentage than the general population uh, but then you look at seven percent uh and clearly people there were not encouraged uh to employ or have the opportunity to do their civic duty and vote so um what did she say um, so those are sort of tantalizing, you know, data bits. Uh, we have a lot of data, for instance, on guardianship uh, and the proportion of guardian, the people who have guardians making decisions on their behalf. Again, big ranges from state to state. So picking your, uh, your priority, looking at the data, seeing where Maryland is, seeing what your local data tells you, um, should make it possible for you to make some really interesting decisions about what to what to pursue uh, and how to pursue it. So I've done a lot of the talking. Um, so uh, Don, are we going to open up the mics and see whether people have any questions? I think it's a small enough group that we probably don't you need to use the hands up. Yeah, um, I'm going to unmute everyone and just um, just for safety, I, not safety, audio um, preservation. Um, if you're not speaking, please um, self-mute. So I'm going to unmute everyone. So hopefully you're on self-mute. And then if you if you want to ask a question, just jump in. All right, here we go. You want to tell Okay, I think I unmuted everyone. Okay, and I'm also looking at a chat to see if there's any questions, and I don't see any typed. So um, why don't we turn this over to the chair, uh, Matt, if there's anything that you, the chair and the co-chair, anything, any questions you have of, of Val? Well, I don't have any uh, particular questions. Um, I think that the this Matt, can you talk a little louder? We can't hear you. Uh, I'm sorry, Patricia, this technology thing is still something I'm getting used to. I don't <laughs> have any um, particular questions at this moment. I just more or less wanted to open um, the the opportunity up for general discussion. And then, uh, you know, based off of that, I might have a question or two. Uh, but I also wanted to thank you for your time Valerie, 
Thanks, Matt. All right, let's see. Any anybody has any questions specific about what Valerie share about the roles and responsibilities of our, of the committee? It's Judy Volkman. Hi there. Go ahead. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you, Valerie. Our paths seem to cross every once in a while. Um, and I was wondering, would we be able to have a copy of your PowerPoint? Uh, Donna, I believe you've put that somewhere in handouts, right? Yes, yes. it's in the panel. But if you want, you can email me if, uh, after the presentation. You didn't get it. I'm, I'm, I'm at Donna.will at Maryland.gov. So I'm, okay. I'm just going to walk people through this. If you look at the chat to the right box, uh, where you see how many people are in attendance. You'll see a poll, you'll see questions, and then there's a little thing that says handouts one. You can right click that or double click it, and then you can upload the presentation and then save it as, so you can save it into your own documents. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions or, or did I just overwhelm you? I hope not. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, if there's one thing that I that I really learned from this is that it's um, it's a very big responsibility for us in the council to really understand number one how the data data is presented and thank you for that overview um, and number two. Um, hopefully that this will give us the tools in the future to request things that we need in order to better understand the data. For example, from this webinar, I learned how crucial it is. Um, you know, sometimes we're given data like, um, let's say 10 people in the central region had um, abuse issues or whatever. Um, now I'm seeing how crucial it is to really see how many, what does that represent? What does that number mean? Is it 10 people out of 10 people being served in the central region or is it 10 people out of 500 or a thousand people being served and that's and so the data that's being presented to us we have a responsibility to see to it that the data is meaningful to us does that make sense well wow, that's no that's terrific uh, and it might be 10 people in one provider organization in which case you really need to be concerned um, yes so understanding uh, compared to what what what's the rate um yeah is this really a serious thing or uh just a blip in the data that no that's great that you uh took that away yeah that's terrific and i think it is important to know um to be able to be in a position to ask for data that you need uh, in terms of clarification now it may be that VDA isn't in a position to that to have the data or it's not recent data um, but being more activist about um, knowing what it is you need to know and, and how you want to know it how do you want it presented what is the most useful way of getting this information um, and also is it being uh, presented in ways that a lay person, a family member who's not used to looking at data tables, uh, can see the import of it without, you know, getting a PhD in statistics. Well, and to your point, Valerie, uh, this is Matt Rice again. I um, actually had a question around inclusiveness, um, not only for people with disabilities, but how do you um, ensure that when we're looking at all of these things that, um, you know, the, the people who may not be sitting in all of these other committees, um, like I do, or like some of the agency folks do who are involved, how, what would you suggest in order to make sure that everybody, you know, feels like their input is um, valued and included because I think that's something that we're kind of uh, 
struggling with, in all honesty. I mean, I've been on the Quality Advisory Council um, since the beginning. I'm now leading it along with um, Judy, who's um, support and um, leadership skills I'm very grateful for uh, in, in providing her input as a family member. But to me, it just seems like, you know, there, there's a lot of you know, talking at people and not necessarily making sure that everything is clearly understood, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And there, there are a couple things that makes me think. Uh, one is uh, making sure uh, that the data is transparent uh, and that is easily accessible to everybody in, in the state, um, that it's not behind you know, the curtain. Um, but just making data transparent does not necessarily mean that data is understandable. So also making sure that uh, where it makes sense that the data is presented in a user friendly way, whether it's using infographics. Uh, we've been uh, preparing user friendly versions um, of our data for a while. Um, but so first, it needs to be accessible or available. But secondly, it needs to be accessible. Um, so that people can get at it. Third, they need to know how and where it is. Um, and I would imagine, you know, unfortunately, in the next period of time, um, holding, you know, open forums in different parts of the state is probably not something you're going to be able to do. But you might think about having uh, a webinar every now and then that's open to the public, where you invite people to talk about an issue that you're really thinking about taking action on um, and holding a, a sort of virtual forum. Interesting. Thank you. Sure. So, Val, this is Patricia. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? I can now, yeah. Yeah, so I'm gonna expand a little bit on Matt's question um, in reference to when presenting data, um, how can DDA make it a little more user-friendly? Um, the last couple of times that we presented the data was so much, and, and I think people feel they're being talked at and not really, not pretty much say, well, this is what it is, and this is what it's telling us, and this is how we interpret it. Um, so it was very, I, I could see, I could feel the frustration of the group. Um, uh, and so just kind of that was, I think, my, get my takeaway, especially when we were doing the QE reports on the basic assurances. Uh, it wasn't like that when we were doing the report on the national core indicators, because those were very simple and easy to do. But when we were pulling health and safety, abuse, neglect, all those things for basic assurances, well, provider qualifications, those were very um, abstract. And I think that even how we presented it, even the presenter was a little confused about the data. Um, oh dear. So, <laughs> I, so, yeah. that happens. <laughs> I know, and, and I just I just kind of sit in the back and just listen, but I can see from the group a, a little bit of frustration. It's like, okay, what is my role? What do I really need to do with this data? Should I be commenting? So maybe um, we can do a better job at how we present to this group as well. So I think your question where you say, what does the committee need and how would they like the data presented to them is important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that everybody really is able to participate and comment on it. Thank you for that, Patricia. It's Esther Ward. I still have nightmares with regard to that presentation. Um, in my case, I did actually understand the data that was presented. And um, I don't know if you were at the, oh, you must have been at the meeting. Um, you know, at the time I did ask the presenter if in the future she could just list how many people are served, what the base number is. Um, also, and it wasn't, I don't know in my case, I don't feel like it was the, that the data was presented um, in a difficult way. I feel like it was clear, but I do feel like we were missing baseline numbers 
And the reason that I still kind of get those, you know, queasy feelings is because of the, the sense of urgency that I think we all felt. You know, we're here to serve you. We want to fix things. We want to help you make things better. And, you know, to be presented with numbers that we really couldn't make sense of, that was what was so hard. So I think it's reflective of, you know, what a good job that you really are doing in terms of, you know, trying to present. And also in terms of having a quality advisory council where we are so engaged and we really do want to make things, you know, good for you and to be there for you. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. Um, so I, I'm gonna have to take Val up and, and maybe share some data and say, can you help us present it in a way and then get maybe share the information with you guys probably a, at least three weeks prior to so that we, we need to took, tweak how we present it so it makes sense so we can have a good dialogue. It would it would be uh, wise of us to do something like that. Any other comments? Danielle, are you unmuted? Danielle. She says she's locked. <laughs> Hello, can, can you me? hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm marked as a panelist, so my mute settings were different. But um, I was just going to let the, the council know that I will be sending out a link to the recording of the presentation and also the PowerPoint. I know you can access it now, but just to make it easier, I'll also attach the PowerPoint presentation in the email I send out. Um, so you are aware, Danielle, I was not able to um, download the PowerPoint that you are going to um, send that out. But it occurs to me, should, um, should myself or any other council member have um, questions that we didn't think of. Um, is there a way that um, we can touch base with you, Valerie? Sure, yeah. Um, my email is V is in Valerie Bradley, B R A D L E Y, V Bradley at H as in Harry, S as in Sam, R I dot org. That's V Bradley at HSRI.org. And if somehow um, you wrote it down wrong, I'm sure you can email Patricia and she can give it to you. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And Matt, Matt, what I was going to say um, under your leadership and, and your co-chair um, with Judy, I think it would be very smart if you guys will go to slides three, four, and five, just to make sure that your charter matches those quality um, council's responsibilities just to be sure because this has been about five years since we created this presentation and then updated it so you want to make sure that that really matches and have the group discuss and see if there's anything from this presentation that you want to not only add to your charter but also add to the orientation of new members so that they would know what would be the expectations from the get-go and i know judy you you were interested in looking at um you know how do we on board new members and what kind of orientation that we need to have, um, that actually would be very helpful too. Yeah, um, Judy and I have um, discussed that after um, this presentation, she and I want to get together at some point and um, look over everything and um, see what we can glean from it and then, um, you know, present to the council in, in future meetings. Perfect. Yeah, we'll do. Okay, any other questions or anything for Val or Danielle or myself? No. I, my regards. Oh, go ahead, Matt. At least not on my end. Um, you know, I think this has been very helpful. 
Um, and I definitely appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks. So Valerie, we don't have anything more on our end that gives everybody five minutes back, but I really do appreciate it. Um, I What I would do as a commitment from DDA is probably see if I can reach out to Val and, and before we present some documents, how we can make it user friendly and that we have the whole story. What is the base? What does it mean? What are we looking for? Um, and then share and see if we can um, Simplify it in a way that you think it, it creates some conversation and some good feedback. Great. And give my regards to Bernie. Tell him I'm really sorry that the Red Sox are in the tank. <laughs> Absolutely. Will do. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Val, Danielle, everybody, committee. Really do appreciate it. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye bye. Bye.